Hello, today is May 27th, 2008, and we are in Natick, Massachusetts. This tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Joan Craig. Our cameraman today is Dan McDermott from Natick Pegasus. And today we are privileged to have with us Roland Gendron. Welcome, Roland. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. May I ask you when and where you were born? I was born in New Bedford, Massachusetts, October 25th, 1932. And you currently live in New Bedford? All my life except four years in the Marine Corps. And you are married? Married, three children, four grandchildren, and been married for 53 years to my wife, Rita. Congratulations. That's a wonderful legacy. Not, not too many people make that today. That's right. That's right. Where and when did you enter the military? I was in New Bedford, Massachusetts, and my father was a uh, janitor of sorts in the registry of deed builder for the county. And this Marine sergeant came downstairs one day, and I says, well, I was impressed by him, the way he talked, the way he looked, the way he walked. And I said, where's the recruiting station? He said, you still in high school? I said, yes, I am, only 17. I can take you. I quit school and joined the Marine Corps January, 7, January 24. Third, 1950. At the age of 17? Yep. So you left school, were you a sophomore or a junior I at was that a time? sophomore. A sophomore, and your dad didn't have a problem with that? Yes, he did. He didn't want to sign. Mm -hmm. He said, I'm not going to sell my son to the government. So my brother was in the army during the Battle of Bulge, and he was at the Normandy. And he said, come on, Pa, sign this thing. Let this guy go and get some education. Be baptized with the fire, he'll be all right. So the, the whole boy signed it. Did you ever go back to school to finish? Yes, I did. When I, I didn't go back to school, really. I came back out, and what they did for us, they had a, a GED, and I took that exam, and I passed it. They said, with flying colors, so they ended up giving me a diploma. That's wonderful. Why did you decide on the Marine Corps? Well, it was kind of a, I wasn't even in mixed emotions at the time. <clears throat> I think what happened, <clears throat> I don't know if I really wanted the Navy or Army or whatever. My brother was trying to talk me to the Army. It's when that guy came downstairs, that recruit sergeant came downstairs. And I kind of impressed by him, the way he stood straight. And I just said to myself, I think I'd like to be in the Marine. Did you have other friends that were joining at that time? Yeah, a lot of them, were, four or five, one in the Air Force, one in the Army, one in the Navy. We kind of all uh, were kids together. We grew up from like 13 years of age to about 17 years of age. And uh, we kind of took off on our own. And when we got out, we came back home and kind of hooked up again with each other. And So you stayed in contact as took friends. Took us separate ways, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you decided on the Marines. You liked the look of a Marine. Well, not, not the uniform per se, but the, the guy, the way his actions were. I uh, was ramrod straight, and I said, maybe this guy, maybe the Marine Corps could teach me something, and they did. Where were you sent when you first signed up? And did you go out of Boston, by the way? Yes, or? we did. We left Boston, and ironically, it was just shortly after the Briggs robbery, January 17, 1950. And we got to Boston that day, the, the uh, one that brought us into the physical room, he said to us, anybody here part of the Briggs robbery? <laughs> Had he you tried to run away, he said. <laughs> We, nobody said, no, we're, we're all set, buddy, we're all set. And but, it was a funny thing. They did an exam on it that, that day, kind of a halfway physical, and I failed the exam. And I said to the guy, why did I fail this exam? He said, your four molars in the back do not touch. I said, oh, what happens now? He says, you're going home. I said, can I come back? Yeah, you get the, you get the molar on the right side, lower, right side, ground down, come home. I rushed back home, hitchhiked home, because we nobody had nobody in those days. Went to the dentist. He said, what about the bill? I said, send it to my father. <laughs> he ground the tooth down. I came right back, hitchhiked right back up to Boston. I made it with the same group. So and you were really determined. And my father got the bill. He, first letter, <laughs> you, you owe me $11. <laughs> so that was, I never paid him. <laughs> so you, you, Went out of Boston, and where did you go from there? Went to Paris Island. Was this your first time out of Massachusetts or out of New England? Well, I've taken trips with my father, driving up to Canada and, you know, 
Connecticut flying pigeons and stuff like that, but yes, it was my first trip to say that I'd been anywhere such a long distance away from home. Now, when you say flying pigeons, is that something your dad did? My father, yeah, he, well, he's a barber, he liked to fly pigeons. And, and by that, explain that. I know what it means, but somebody well, may not. Well, he used to race pigeons. And when they take the pigeons, they take the best ones. I didn't know at the time, being just a kid. But they take the best pigeons, and they put them in a race. And you had to go sign up at this place that was called the German Club. And what they were doing, they take a rubber band, and they would put it on a pigeon's foot and mark it. <clears throat> then they had this clock, and they set the clock, and they seal it. And when the pigeon came, wherever they brought the pigeons, they brought, when they fly home, you were in a coop, and you had to take the rubber band off the pigeon, drop it in the clock, and turn it. So it stopped the clock, and that's how they could determine who won the race. Fascinating. And my father used to tell me, you got to hurry up with your dinner. You're going to go clock pigeons today. Sunday afternoon, I never forgot. I hurry up, swallow your food, get your indigestion, and I go to the coop, and I'd say, he'd say to me, you got to say, kutuk, kutuk. <laughs> <laughs> What do I know about flying pigeons? But I realized they could too, could too. And, you know, I had a good time. I learned a lot by it. Well, now, did he keep them in the backyard? Yeah, or? we had a big, we had about an acre of land and kept the pigeons in the back. And uh, we just had a good time pigeons. He had, we had a garden, and I used to hate gardens because it made, he made me weed them and hold the potatoes and everything. It was life in those days. It was good. I enjoyed everything. So you went from there, you went to Paris Island. Paris Island. What were your first remembrances? What was it like? The very first one is when we got off a bus from the train station to go to Paris Island. I could never forget that drill instructor. Oh, on the, from the train to the bus, he said, oh, smoking lamp is lit, good, have a good time, smoke, smoker. We get to that main gate, talk about a Jekyll and Hyde. He said, you guys belong to me. Your mothers and fathers are home. I said, uh-oh, I'm in deep trouble. Yeah. And we got off the bus and we marched in after the main gate, and we marched up to the barracks, and that was my start. I, we were, we were really, why I liked the Marine Corps after that was we were real disciplined. Everything was disciplined. And you know, when you're in boot camp and they teach you, you don't say no, you don't smoke, you don't eat, you don't do nothing until you're told. I think that's the best training going. You've learned discipline. Something that you don't get that at home, that strong and that overwhelming thrown at you. And for a 17-year-old kid to come out of a house the, with my father and my stepmother, my mother died when I was only six years old. And uh, I learned at that time that I have to listen to people in authority. And that's, I thought that was the best training I could ever get. You, were you one of the younger members of the group? No, a lot of us, most of us, 17. 17 years old. As a matter of fact, if a guy was 20 years old, we used to call him Pop. He was one of the older folks. Old, old man. Sure. How long were you at um, Paris Island? 12 weeks in Paris Island. And then I came home for a 10-day leave, all by bus. Trailway bus, God love them. And then we took the bus back, and we ended up going back to Camp Lejeune. I had to report to Courthouse Bay, and that was an amphibious base in, in, um, in uh, Lejeune. And the, the tractors were kept at Courthouse Bay, and then we had some at the park in Onslow Beach. Beautiful land, and that's where we used to practice. And what would you practice? Talk amphibious about what tractors. a day would be like. Well, the amphibious tractors were Two, they were, they were run by two Cadillac engines, and on each side was a big track with scoops on them. And you'd tear up a road with that, it was awful. But it was designed to go over the beach, into the water, go out the ship, get troops, put the troops in, come back to the beach, drop the gate, let the troops out to go to the battle, and then we'd roll the gate back up and go back out and get some more troops. Well, that couldn't happen in Korea when, uh, at, at Incheon, it was, a, it was a battle where, yes, they did use amphibious tractors. Then it was a big seawall, and they had to blow that up with Bangalore torpedoes. I can't re remember the tales of the first guys over that wall. It was awful, because they were lobbing mortars on them. Then after the Incheon and Kempo Airfield and Sewell were taken, and the Han River, settled it all down. We turned around, left some units there, and came back aboard ship, 
went to Wonsan, and Wonsan Harbor was the most heavily mined bay in, in years. They haven't seen that many mines. So they had to abort the landing. And we, when we finally got into Wonsan, here was Bob Hope. He was there. Doing a said, USO tour? Oh, welcome home, guys. <laughs> really? Home. Yeah. But we couldn't get in. They just the, the, were so bombed, uh, so uh, loaded with bombs, uh, mines. In the harbor itself. In the harbor itself. Well, let's back up a little bit first. You were in training first, went to Camp Lejeune, training with these amphibious tractors. Right. Um, when you were sent to Korea, because it was during the Korean conflict, did you go as... No, it wasn't. It wasn't? No, because uh, when I got there in March of 1950, the Korean War didn't break out until June 25th, 1950. So when you it, were there early? No. No, I didn't get there till uh, I mentioned the Incheon Landing. Even though I was only 17, 17 year olds couldn't be admitted to combat at that time. I wouldn't turn 18 until the 25th of October. On the 26th of October, I was aboard ship landing at Wonsan. Coming from where? From, we, they kept us in Japan for more training. Okay, Camp so Lejeune. from Camp Lejeune, you went to? We trained and we trained and we trained. Yeah. And in, in June, uh, that's when the war broke out. And I can remember the guy's name, Colonel Stoll. He said to us, let's go, guys. We're going to get wrap it up and get ready. We got all the amphibious tractors together, ammunition, all the fuel we needed. And we ro rode down to the, uh, trail, like the rain, railroad yard, put the Amtraks aboard low beds on the railroad, and we trucked them to California. And in California, we unloaded the ship at San Diego, and uh, we picked up an awful lot of Marines out of the. That was the second. Marine, that was the first Marine division on the West Coast. We were the second Marine division on the East Coast. We picked up a lot of reserves in in uh, California. that came down from Stockton, from Washington, all all over the place, and we loaded aboard a General Megs was a ship M E I G S. That was the name of it, the General Megs. Right, and we, we what we did on board the Megs was this that uh, just like a troop ship. It took us fourteen days to get to Japan. We went to Kobe, unloaded the ships. The guys that were going to be going to the Incheon landing on September fifteenth, they went into LSTs and LSDs, landed the ship tank and landed the ship docks. The amphibious tractors went aboard those ships. And they went to Incheon. We picked them up in uh, a board ship uh, at the harbor on my birthday, October 25th. And then on the 26th, we were trying to get into Wonsan. We couldn't get in. And that was because the harbors were? The harbor was uh, heavily mined. Now, when we were in Wonsan, we were loading the ships to bring everything aboard uh, on shore, set up the fuel dumps, set up the ammo dumps, set up the supply dumps. Then we were taking train runs they knew we were going to go to the reservoir. Nobody knew at our time in our outfit. We were running train runs up to Hung Nam and Ham Hung. And uh, when we finally got up there to set up a new fuel dump and uh, supply dump, we were getting a lot of uh, uh, train runs. We were getting ambushed. Now, was it by Koreans? Yeah, the North Koreans. North Koreans. We're already in North Korea now. This is above the 38 barrel. So the train runs, we're going up there, loaded up with supplies. And when we finally got in there, you know, we ambushed. Every trade we had was ambushed. I lost four or five good buddies on those ambush runs. And at this point, you are just 18 years old. Just turned 18. What was that like for you as an 18-year-old? I was scared. Mm -hmm. If anybody said they weren't scared, they're lying. You had to be scared. Uh, it, it, it was an experience that you, you only hope you see once in your lifetime. But, We've seen several of them in Korea. And losing friends, what was that like for you? That hurt. Mm -hmm. One guy to get on a train run over there. I was with him about a week before we left Lejeune. And he got a nice tattoo on his arm. And the North Koreans let him have it right through the tattoo. Now when you say you're ambushed, how close were you in combat with these North Koreans? Well, it was close enough to say that uh, we could see they had brown eyes, but we never knew what kind of uniform they had. 
and they would just come aboard ship and start raking it with fire, with the ammunition fire. Uh, the night that my buddy got it, he was in the front of a train where they, they had set up a 30 caliber machine gun, and they, they hit him first. And then they get the other gunner, and they, owned the, they just about owned the train. We were in the back, and we were able to write, get rid of them all by machine gun fire. And then they let us go through. How long would something like that take? from the time that your friend got hit to the time that you were able to take the train back and have control? It, 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 seemed, it seemed like uh, hours, but really it was a very short period of time. Very few firefights last an awful, awful long time, unless you really get the enemies got heavily loaded with ammunition and stuff like that. But that day we would get in that little skirmish and uh, put a couple of guys out on watch so the guys would get a few Zs to sleep a little bit because they always hit us at night. They never hit us on the day, it was always at night. And it always be right at dusk. And you couldn't see them that good, but you knew they were there. And when they hit you, you just fight back. Now you mentioned this was on a train. Yes, supply train. Uh, so you were going from one area to another. Bringing supplies up. up. So once you got to the base mm -hmm. where you were going, did you have time? To rest. Yes, we did. And then you would go back. Take the, the get back on the train and go back down to Warsaw and load up again. Back up for another run. Now we finally got into Hung Nam, and Hung Nam was the was the um, kind of a jumping off point. And uh, they said to us, "You can't take your amphibious tractors because you're going to tear up the road." and uh, tear up the road, they were right, because we had, like I told you before, we had scoops on those tracks. They would tear up the road so much it wouldn't be, wouldn't be passable. But no one told us there was only one road up and one road back. That's the scary part. So we ended up with bulldozers, that's what ended up with the 7th Marines. We ended up with bulldozers, they took the bulldozers up, we started supplying everything on the tractors and trailers of the bulldozers, and all about bulldozers and the big six-by trucks and weapons carriers and tanks used to go up because their tracks were scoops. And uh, the, the Battle of the Reservoir started somewhere around, I like to say around November, early November, first week in November. Of 1950? 50, yep. Yeah. And we didn't pull out of there until Christmas of 1950, 50, 1950. So it was a whole month? Just about six weeks, actually. Six to eight weeks we were, uh, we were battling. And what the scary part of that was that if people don't know about the Chosun Reservoir, it was all right while we were fighting the North Koreans. You know, it was e equal numbers. Then when they brought the Chinese in, and it was two, they estimated, intelligence said there was 220,000 of them, and there was only 18,000 of us. So when they came in, the 5th Marines, 11th Marines, 7th Marines, and 1st Marines were at the reservoir. And uh, they had, we had set up a main line of resistance, and also the M, they call it MLR and they call it MSR, the main supply route, going up on the road to the reservoir. Hagari, you damn need. Those are words we couldn't even say in those days. Then the Army came in, they were on the other flank. They took an awful beating up there also. And on the way back, the, the winter hit. The winter hit so rapidly, it was 35 degrees below zero. And that was before the wind chill factor, so we never really knew how cold it really was. But you know what? Your body felt it. Were you appropriately attired? No. You didn't have the appropriate warm clothing no. or boots or? No. We had what they called the leather boots or boondockers up to the ankles, and you, you had uh, cushion sole socks, and dungarees, and a parka, and you just froze. Cold, I can't believe, I, I don't even know how we could survive. How we ever survive, I'll never know. It must have been youth. Were you in huts, tents? No. You were out in the open? Open, the open. You fought, you slept in the cold. Did you ever feel like you wanted to just give up? Well, I'm going to tell you, the Marine Corps taught you never to give up. Mm -hmm. And uh, I and I really enjoy our leaders over there, and if I name a couple of Major Noonan, Ray Davis, 
and the famous Jesse Puller. Now, when uh, when the war gets beat so bad at uh, Hagaruri and Udamni, uh, I was in my outfit was in Kodari, which is about seven miles south of the reservoir, and they started bringing these guys out frozen solid. They were so grotesque; their arms were all twisted. And that's where they died. War is horrible. That's what you said. War is terrible. It should never happen. <clears throat> We brought them down, put them in, in Hung Nam. Well, they came with us aboard trucks. That road down to Hung Nam was 57 miles to go. It was I think it was a 70 mile road. We had about 57 miles to go. They blew up a bridge on us. Couldn't get out, we were trapped. And back in those days, they had the walkie talkies. So they, they uh, sent the notice back to Chesty, uh, he was a Colonel Puller at the time. And and is that P-U-L-L-E-R? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, you know, they got us trapped. They took the bridge out, and they got us trapped. And his famous words were, good, we got him right where we want him. <laughs> well, you don't tell that to an 18-year-old kid because everyone is scared. But they used to hit us real bad when that bridge went down. Every night we knew we were going to get hit. Now, you had to battle the cold. Every once in a while they put some tents up and put a pot belly stove fed. And you might see pictures of it at Udamni, Hagaruri, because they'd hurry up, put two or three tents up with stoves in so the guys could go in and get warm and come back out. It, I, I can't say how cold it was, it just un inhumanly cold. Since that time, and I'm, I don't want to jump ahead because I want to stay on target, but since that time, have you had any other symptoms against cold or? Health-wise, with yes, regards to I have. To I get frostbitten legs, mm -hmm. my toes. I still lose toenails every year. Because of that and yeah. because of what you went through. They tell, they tell you it's going to last forever. What did you have to eat? You couldn't... <laughs> I'm glad you asked. We had sea rations. Tell us about those. Frozen solid in a can. Frozen solid in a can. Everything froze. We were told only put half canteens of water because if they froze, the canteens would burst, metal canteens. But the sea rashes, the only way we could warm them up, like I said, I was looking at bulldozers. Had to keep them running all the time, the, the fuel would freeze. If your, fruit, uh, if your fuel lines froze, there's no way you're going to get out of there. Everything had to keep running. You gassed up while the truck was running, gassed up while the, while the uh, bulldozer was running on a tank, everybody gassed up. And uh, even the rifles, Get back into this cold. The 105 how, uh, howitzers, the anti aircraft or heavy equipment uh, aircraft weapons, 155, it was so cold they couldn't even breach. To breach, they would have to fire around, and this thing used to come back and eject the shell. They put another one in. It was so cold it wouldn't even breach. And some pilot, uh, some lieutenant decided to say, you know, why don't, when they go to Japan, why don't they get whale oil? The viscosity of that stuff is good for this. These things, a few drops will probably let the thing breach. <clears throat> well, the next run, I guess, the pilots came in with some whale oil, in fact, distributing amongst this heavy weapon. And you know what? It worked. The whale oil freed them up and it was out able to fire because they were firing shot rounds. They'd elevate the thing and it's supposed to go 11 miles, go maybe six or seven miles and hit. You don't want to hit your own troops. But it was whale oil that did it. And, and I'm from New Bedford. You know about city. whale oil, right? And I can never forget when I see a sign when I was a kid, Nye Oil Company, and that's how I remember it. Nye Oil Company in Fairhaven, Massachusetts. I said, wow, that hit me. Mm -hmm. In Korea, 18 years old, I said, well, now I know what whale oil is all about. That's right. And <laughs> well, it helped it, save some lives, I'm sure. I'm sure it did. Now, when you're talking the, about the, your food and your rations yeah. and frozen, were you able to light fires to try to keep yes, warm? Yes, we could. We could light fires. Try to light fires only in the daytime, of course. At night would be suicidal. And uh, we'd light fires and stick, punch holes in the cans and stick them in the fire, get them warm. Eight guys were struggling for hamburg patties. Nobody wanted the lima beans. Uh, it was a way of life, I guess, and we, we survived. Cocoa patties were their favorite. What were cocoa patties? They used to serve as cocoa patties wrapped in a cellophane. And we'd take a cup full of snow, 
Let's get you get from the stone, put it in the fire, get it nice and warm, and drop the cocoa patty in and drink it down. And drink it. It was pre-sweetened and supposed to have milk in it. And that was awfully good. Awfully good. With other interviews, a number of the gentlemen who have interviewed with us have talked about going to a front line and then going back to at least have a little rest and then going back up. What? I don't know. No. You never were not, able not, to not, do not, that. Not, in, not, in the, not coming out of the reservoir. Now talk about, for those who may not know the history of the Chosan Reservoir, was it an actual reservoir? Yes, it was. It, they used to use it for hydroelectric plant, plants. And uh, they had a huge hill. It was kind of water in hills. I think they, they, put, they built the road hills around it, too, to s save the water. And I guess that's where they used to use it for the hydroelectric plants up there. And it was up to you to take the hill? Well, we were there. General MacArthur said, we're going to reach the Yellow River. If you reach the Yellow River by Christmas, we'll all be home. Hello. We weren't home. We didn't reach the Yellow. That's when Truman fired him. Sorry to see him leave, but he might have been right and he might have been wrong. Had he brought us into China at that time, I think the whole division could have been annihilated because there were more of them than there were of us. Did you ever see MacArthur? Nope. But you heard about him? Yep. He, he, was, uh, he was in the news every day with us. And what, what, what did you hear? He was a good general. Everybody agreed if we reached the Yellow, we're going to go home for Christmas. It just was never meant to be. I never did see him in person. When you were together and not in combat, did you have a chance to even relax a little bit? Oh, sure. You, you had to be. Breaks were not like the, you know, everybody thinks you fight, 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 fight. It's not like that every day. You get guys covered for you like you're going to cover for them. And you had your time. You, there's no liberty, of course, because you had to be where you were. But it wasn't all fight, fight, fight. But how did you stay, get any kind of comfort, even on, uh, on a day when you weren't in combat, if you were under such terrible winter conditions? You know, it's so mind-boggling. I really can't ever I, remember. Yeah. There was no walking around. You had a gun placement or moving around, getting your tractors going, getting your bulldozers lined up. And What did you do? In looking through history, sometimes you would see that individuals would try to dig foxholes or whatever, but you couldn't because no, it was frozen ground, land. Yeah. So where did you sleep, and how did you sleep? You, we, if we could get some canvas, build a parapet of canvas, the guys just lay down behind the parapet so the wood would blow over you, but it was still cold. And I never, never went, very few of us ever went into a sleeping bag. You never get out of there quick enough, you get attacked. Most of the guys are just laying on the cold ground and pulling the sleeping bag over them. Or sleep underneath a bulldozer where at least you get some warmth from an engine running. Or you'd climb on the cardboard boxes from the sea rations. You just found something to try to stay warm. Did you get news from home? Not then. No. And you said you were there for about six to eight weeks. More or less six to eight weeks. Yeah. And what was your rank at that time? PFC. A lot of us made corporal, making sixty dollars a month. Hello, they make that in a week, now, a day now. Did you get a lot of um, air or naval support when you needed it? I don't have the pit with me, but we have a. The, the I belong when we come home. I joined the chosen few. They chose their logo, a star. It's a starburst. It's a beautiful pit. And uh, what that was was <coughs> couldn't get airstrikes simply because it was no cover. It was all foggy or gray. They just, the pilot just couldn't come in. And they were looking for that star. If they looked at one of the sky, they were like, hey, there's a star up there. There's a star up there. And they, everybody started cheering because we knew the next day would be nice. And that's when we got airstrikes. They used to come and strafe the hills where we get by. And that's how that started. When you talk about the hills, was it trees and hills? Barren, barren land. Mm -hmm. Yes, there was like scrub pine that you see around here. That's what was there, salt scrub pines. It was so cold. It was just I don't know. I don't even know the habits of 
Korea lived in those days because they had, at least they had little huts with, with some kind of heat and then they see the smoke coming from the chimneys. These were some of the villages that you would see? Yeah, but see? they were not Koreans. We didn't know whether to go in and trust them or not, so you had to be careful. Right. Some guys used to go in the huts with them. I'm sorry? Some guys went in the huts with them yeah. to get some warmth to come back out. But they had tents set up for us too, you know. It wasn't all that critical as it may be sounding as I'm talking. But the tents were set up with pot-bellied stoves, and we had some heat. But you, you were sleeping in there at night, <laughs> getting me out and around. What happened when someone took ill? They had aid stations, but you got to bring them to a corpsman first. If you, t if you got wounded in Korea, it took you a long time before you got medical evac. Today, it's, it's almost instant you're aboard ship. It wasn't like that then. It just was not like that. Corman took care of you. And it was so cold, I can remember the Corman, he was, his name was Schultheis from Pennsylvania. He would take care of the wounded. He would put the morphine capsules in his mouth so he wouldn't freeze, and then break the tip off so he could inject the morphine in the guys that get wounded or really in pain. If you took sick, you took sick. Now you mentioned you did have some frostbite. Yeah. Was that treated there or after? No, you know. You treated yourself? Something happens in frostbite that you can, it comes on you later in life. Mine came later in life. My legs had turned purple on me. And they're still purple today. So that's the way frostbite runs. Some of the guys were so cold Constantly, they turned blue instantly. They were dying. The blood just wouldn't flow. You said that you felt your officers, and you mentioned Major Noonan and a Ray Davis, that they were good leaders. Do you remember anything in particular that really made you feel comfortable with them? Well, I always believe that General Davis and absolute, well, General Davis, he was a colonel then. Colonel Davis and Colonel Toller and my, my uh, friend Major Noonan was our company commander. I thought they knew their job very well. As a matter of fact, guys used to credit them with saving our lives up there because of their leadership. They had good leadership qualities. They knew how to set up positions. They knew exactly what to do. <clears throat> but as an 18 year old, who thinks of that? But looking back now. Looking back now, I always say they're good leaders. And I saw General Davis in uh, Washington, D.C. a couple of years ago, a month before he died. And I went up to him and I said, General Davis, 7th Marines, he said, 7th Marines, lean on me. And he gave me his challenge coin, and I give him one of mine. And he died a month later. What a nice guy. Uh, everybody loved him. And you carry challenge coins around with you? And I guess a bit of card I don't have with me. But you share them yeah. with other Marines? Yes, yeah, we do, yeah. yeah. Were you wounded in combat at all? No. Did you come in close? I got nicked to the leg, but no big deal. Back then, the Coleman ripped the he ripped the pad leg open, put sulfur on it. You're on your way. No, I never really got hit. Uh, one of the lucky ones. How how you had talked about the quality or the medical care in the corpsmen. How do you think the quality of medical care was, especially where you said that they couldn't get them out? You know, it was hard for me to think of quality of uh, medical care at that time. But I do know that anybody that got wounded real bad, they put them on the side of a jeep and ran them out of there. They got them to an aid station, maybe a mash unit further on south, but they got them there somehow. Today it's all helicopters and we had evac helicopters then too with open sides. They used to strap them in a bucket and run them out uh, there to more severely wounded. What was the outcome of the Battle of Chosun Reservoir? I really can't say we won the battle. We really can't say we won that war. Although South Korea is free today because of the war, you know, I really believe that we helped those South Korean people an awful lot. Have you ever been back? No. Nope. How did you hear about the progress in other areas of South and North Korea? They had this paper, Stars and Stripes, and every once in a while you'd get the Stars and Stripes and you could read it. Sometimes you read about it four or five days later, four or five weeks later, uh, about what went on in other parts of that country. Today, 
25 minutes, you know what's going on all over the world. But technology is beautiful today. You said you couldn't go on an R&R, &R, which would be a little break. There was no R&R &R in those days, mm -hmm. unless you really got wounded. If you got wounded, you went to a board ship or you went to Japan. When you were ready enough to come back, you came back to your unit and went back online. I was not one of those fortunate ones. Uh, unfortunate ones. Not fortunate. I was fortunate enough to get hit. But when we get back to down South Korea, it wasn't that bad. You know, we were the Division CP, like I said to you before, they'd yank us out for a few days, they'd come back. Go up, set up an airstrip someplace, portable airstrip someplace, they'd come back. At least we're back in, quote, friendly territory that we thought would be in friendly territory. Although we'd still have to set up uh, command posts all the way around that perimeter so as not to allow infiltrators to come in because they had they used to hide in caves on us and everything. Did you ever see the caves? Yeah, because Major Noodle was one of the guys that said, we're not going to go in there with a machine gun anymore. Guys, we're going in there with flamethrowers. Too many guys were going in and they'd get hit. So he went in with flamethrowers and then we'd get hit no more. Okay, war is not a joke. Were you given enough information before facing the North Koreans and the Chinese about how they would fight or how they would? I'm sure intelligence got a hold of that, but uh, we weren't privy to that kind of intelligence. If, uh, like I said, if you were told to go up that hill and stay there, stay there and hold the hill until you found it feasibly impossible that you were told to come down. And when you mention being in close combat, was reality that these, the enemy was young kids like you? Yes. A lot of them were young, they were probably 16, 15, 16. And some of them looked, to me, they looked older. Uh, I can remember one, one incident that I will ever forget. On a cold night, my buddy and I stayed in this little, it looked like some kind of a hole in the, in the mountain, small hole, and the brush was coming over that f frontal and there was snow and ice on it. We went under it and stayed in it that night. We couldn't find our way back. We heard some crunching and we peeked through this, oh boy, the platoon of the Chinese coming in with their white, uh, they had their white uh, quilted uniforms on with white K-Park boots. So they were dressed according to well, the winter? Well, they froze too. That was okay. cold. That was right. feather dusters, I guess they call them. It was an odd thing that night. We heard the crunching, and it, it drifted off. We didn't hear it no more. And that night, we, we, we put our feet, I, I put my feet against his feet. We'd pump bicycles, the blood going cold. The other one, we didn't want it to freeze to death. So anyway, the next day we got out, we were able to wheel, wheel around, and we got about a quarter of a mile or so down the road, uh, down to a pathway, and we saw that platoon that went there at night. They must have stopped to eat. Every one of them froze solid with their legs crossed. This, this. They must have been soaking wet. You know, we could see they must have got soaking wet, and they uh, froze to death, every one of them. What was it like to see that? Gruesome and horrible. I, you know, you just want to get back to your own friendly troops. Mm -hmm. Now, when you say you, were you on a tractor type of? No, we were on alone. They sent us out. To, so you uh, were walking. Look up, look up over a hill to see where the quote enemy was. Yeah. And we found him, but we didn't. Want, we're, we're afraid to come out of that little tunnel. We didn't want to get killed. Sure. So we just kind of waited, waited uh, outside that little tunnel. Came back the next day. And that, I never forget that day, the, the uh, password was New York Yankees, but we didn't hear it. So uh, we got in there and we heard a guy holler, what's the password? And I said, Boston. He says, wrong team, buddy. <laughs> I said, Boston Braves, Boston Red Sox, wrong team, buddy. So then we yelled out, New York. And uh, my buddy hollers out, Dodgers. He says, that's in Brooklyn. Come on through. <laughs> <laughs> so there's some humor involved, too, you know. You could laugh through all oh, yeah, of that. Yeah, it was. And uh, I didn't even know if I should say this or being interviewed, but I can recall 
uh, Major Noonan, one night we were going to get hit, and we are going to hit a crunching. And he stands over the hill and he says, oh boy, we're going to get it tonight, guys. And the crunching would have been there the, walking the on snow, the, the snow. The snow or, or right. ice or whatever. Yeah. And I remember Major Noonan that night, he said, you know what I can't understand? All these Chinese guys are there, i got to do my own laundry. <laughs> So he's trying to lighten up the... Everybody had a little bit of humor. Sure, sure. Do you feel that you were properly trained and equipped for the combat that you faced? I don't think we were dressed for the combat. I believe we were trained for the combat. We had the proper weapons, just as good as theirs. Uh, we were just better trained, I think, than what they were uh, overall. When you were with this group, uh, approximately how many were in your, was it a battalion? Pl platoon. Platoon. Platoons carried about 40 men. And out of the 40 men, how many made it back? Except for the trade runs, we came back home to base out about 30 guys, I guess, something like that, about 30. Yeah. Some guys took some heavy hits up there. 11 Marines took a awful beating. Fifth Marine Circle, especially in the reservoir area. So I said I was very lucky. I was seven miles south of the reservoir. Very, very lucky. Uh, my buddy was in the first Marines. They lost the uh, thirty some odd, almost a platoon of guys. They said that um, somewhere around uh, out of the eighteen thousand of us that were there, something like five thousand walked out. Only 5,000. Or, or came out aboard a, a truck. At least we were driving or walking out. And uh, how many of them died as a result of those entries? I really don't know. Okay. I really don't know. I know one thing. Some of them were frozen so solid, I don't even know how true the story is. But I can remember the corpsman telling us that some of those guys aboard that truck that were frozen solid, they finally came to, and they, they were alive. Now, I don't know if it's a miracle or what, but that's what I recall him saying. And you hear about some things like that with... In true light. In like drowning right now. in yeah. very cold water, so perhaps back then with the lowered temperature, it Could put well them be. in a state yeah. until they were able to get warmth and thaw out. Yeah. out. But they, they lived. That is amazing. Now, the humanitarian story. You, you, you would hear two figures coming from different angles of this, depending on what ships the guys knew about. But I can recall our point was 14,000 refugees we took out of North Korea to bring back to Pusan. After reading one of the books, they said there's 100,000 that came out put aboard ships. And the USS, I think it was Meredith was one of them, was a victory ship. They just jammed that thing full with North Koreans. Young and old. Young and old, men, women, children, all, all refugees that were fighting with their feet, so to speak. They want to get out. They were voting with their feet. They just want to get out of there. And they took them down to Pusan. But I can remember the staging area in Pusan, like a big baseball field. These men and women and children would go in there and they hugged the South Koreans like they knew them for 100 years. They were just so happy to be in a free area. So happy. And Pusan is South Korea. South Korea, way down south. Now, the humanitarian I will tell you about a little girl. We were coming down with bulldozers. And this little Chi little Korean girl came out. I can never forget the look on her face. She had long black hair, olive skin, and tears were streaming down her eyes. And she grabbed me by the parker and she says, Thank you, thank you. And she started babbling in Korean. I give her at that time probably around nine years old. Here I am, 18, half, which is my age. Well, my father always told me, never be so tall that you get stuck down to a child. So I get down, reach in my pocket, give her a cocoa patty. She shook her head. No, she didn't want a cocoa. She said, thank you, thank you. And she started babbling in Korean. I didn't know what she was saying. So you give her a hug, give her a little cocoa patty, you're off you go. Well, the next day we ended up in this mesa on an area, a staging area. And I look across the fence and there's this little girl there. It was her. I went up and she kept saying, thank you, and she's still crying. So I called the interpreter over and I said, 
why is she saying thank you? So he talked to her. He said, she's saying thank you because you were the first one she saw when she ran out of the house. There was three enemy soldiers in her house. They wanted to kill her father, mother, and her two sisters. And when they heard the bulldozers coming down the road in the tanks, they fled out the back door and they hid into a rice stock. They started to put the rice stock up and they hid hiding in there. And when she saw you, she figured you were a liberator. She's thanking you for saving her life and her father and mother. Her father and mother. And I, said, I couldn't believe it. a little nine-year-old girl. My word. My word. That's what they were going through. Now, before I go too far, when she, she had her hand clenched on the road, and when I saw her the next day, she still had her hand clenched, and I said to the interpreter, well, she got in her left hand, and she opened it up, and it was a flag, an American flag that she made out of a little piece of sheet with the red stripe, the white, seven red, and six white, and she had a field of blue with 48 stars and little white, little white dots, because we only had 48 states in those days. And she, that's what she thinks about the Americans. Had a little flag right in her hand. And when I asked him what her name was, he says, Chon Chudi. That's all he told me, Chon Chudi. I never know, wouldn't know her last name or whatever. And uh, he said she goes to school in town, and she'd be going to school tomorrow and every day, to go, seven days a week. It was kind of a Catholic type of a school. And uh, the, the uh, priest uh, would add, they had a room alongside where the, you could attend church services, and the room alongside the church was for school services, like something like we have in this country with school at the first level, I guess, a church at the second level. I really don't know how it runs, but we'll, we'll say something like that. And uh, she went to school at a Catholic school there, and we guys were collecting money to give to her, give to the school, but the, the priest was so happy. But those are humanitarian stories that you... You don't always hear about all of the good. No, you don't hear the good you do. Right. Or you hear the bad. So how long were you in Korea? From uh, October, and I came home in December of 1951. So you were there for over a year? Yeah. I volunteered to stay one year, because my buddy had got hit. And I went up to Pohang, which was a, one of the most beautiful beaches I've ever seen in my life. All beautiful white sand, and the ships were parked on the harbor. They couldn't come in because they, they were drafting too much. And our amphibious tractors would go out and pick up the gasoline that were unloaded for fuel, oil, or for, for uh, the jet planes. And they put six barrels in an amp track, in a, in a net, you run that to shore, they would hook it up, and that was our job, to hook up the rope and to take it off and put it in a cargo dump, in a gas dump, for the air wing, the marine air wing that was right across the road from where we were stationed. That was nice, that was nice weather. That was good, even though it was cold, it was nice. It wasn't nowhere near the zero weather. And it was more comfortable conditions? Absolutely, we had a nice tent to sleep in at night, and I mean, of course we had guys watching, you know, everybody pulled guard duty. And ironically, when I left there in December 1951, that is the same air wing that Ted Williams was stationed at. And uh, years go by, a year goes by, I'm in Lejeune, and I decided to go to the air wing at Lejeune, at Cherry Point. And I asked them if any guys were in Korea at that air wing, and they said, yes, we were. A couple of pilots were talking to me, and he said, one of them flew right wing for Ted Williams. And he said, you know, he was such a famous guy that they had to set up, instead of four planes in his squad, he set up five, one to watch over him. Because <laughs> he'd, he'd get hit, he wouldn't care. He'd stay right there. Get out of there. No, he'd stay right there. He was, they said he was a nut. Tall guy just about fit in his plane. He was one heck of a guy. Can you imagine if this guy wouldn't have gone into World War II and Korean War? He'd have broke all the records in baseball. Sure, sure. Yeah, Did but, you ever see him? Only at Fenway Park. At Fenway. Hmm. Yep. So when when you, December of 51. Come home. And how did you get home? Did you go through the West Coast or? No, we, we flew from, uh, from Pohang. We flew into um, Osaka, Japan. We got deloused. Where they spray it down with DDT or whatever they do. I don't know. 
You change your clothes and throw it out and then put this powder stuff all over you. And half the guys were trying to choke on it. But <laughs> it was awful smelling stuff. And we stayed at Osaka for somewhere around a week. Um, let me see. You know, I, I might be a week ahead of time here. We left Japan December the 9th. Mm -hmm. So we must have got to Korea. We also left Korea f in the first part of December. Yeah, because I thought it was only 13 months. And then Japan to? Osaka. And when we were in Osaka, they deloused us. And I can recall the day we landed, we went into, we flew into Osaka. They, they said to us, you can have anything you want to eat. 10 o'clock at night, they go into the mess hall and my, my buddy says, I'll have a dozen eggs and two quarts of milk. <laughs> he said, what are you gonna do? I'm gonna eat it, we haven't had fresh eggs in a year. <laughs> but it's too quick, give him 12 fresh eggs. He swallowed them all and drank two quarts of milk. <laughs> I, I couldn't believe he was doing this. But do you remember what you had? I had a couple of eggs, but I couldn't, I couldn't eat a dozen of them. No. Oh. And they were running like a chicken. And yeah, we stayed there for some, just a few days. When I got deloused, we jumped aboard a boat, uh, ship, and they came on a John Pope. On the John Pope? Yeah, and uh, we landed in San Francisco, and guys that I was in Korea waited for me. They knew you were coming? Yeah, they knew we were coming on, coming on the next half. Uh, one guy's name was Richard Bepler, and the other guy was Max Aragon. And uh, they met me at the ship. We came down, I stayed that night with him. And now we had to get our own train stations going, our own transportation home. So I got a hold of this one guy. He was from Chicago. His name slips me right now. But uh, he tried to get us a flight Christmas time, December. No flights. We're looking at, we're already looking at about the 18th or so of, of December. No flights. So he got us a train put together, troop train. Went down south. Went to Texas, back up to Chicago. Dump you off at Union Station in Chicago. I come aboard a ship to I come aboard a train right to Providence, Rhode Island, going to Boston. But I have a luck out. I jumped out of Providence with my sea bag and they half a half a sea bag with me. And I started hitchhiking. We were looking at twelve o'clock at night. And uh started hitchhiking out of Rhode Island and I, I could visualize it being been there before. And I could arrive from a tra trailer, truck driver was going to the Cape, Cape Cod. And he said, where are you? And I said, I'm Marie. He said, Semper Fi, get in. And I said, oh, I knew I was in friendly territory again. So uh, he took me, he said, where you go? I live on Hathaway Street in New Bedford. Back then I lived on Hathaway Street. And uh, how do I get there? I said, well, you're going to stay on Route 6, aren't you? Go to Cape? No, no, I'm going to take you home. You're going to be kidding me. Oh, isn't that nice? By the time we get to the house, it was about 1.30 in the morning. And I said, here's where I live. He took the turn, his tractor trailer down the street. <laughs> One third in the morning, I, it was somewhere around, at that time, maybe the 20th or 21st of December. I actually don't remember the exact date. And he let me out, I grabbed my sea bag. He pulls this button, the, whoa! <laughs> all the lights were, what the going they on? They all knew you were home. What's going on out there? <laughs> Did your folks know you were coming? Could yeah, you I, send I, them? I called them, I didn't call them, I, um, called my brother, and my brother, because my father didn't have a telephone. I called my brother, my brother said, I'll call dad in the morning. I said, okay. So he called him in the next morning, and your man waiting for me eagerly. I said, the horn wake you up? He said, sure did. <laughs> they were all, you know, they glad to see you, because you haven't seen him in a year. Sure, sure. And then back, stayed there for 30 days, I guess, and I went back to Lejeune, Cap Lejeune, and then I was training guys out of a boot camp about amphibious tractors. And how long we, did you have to do the training before you were discharged? I had still have two more years to go in the Marine Corps. Did you really? So were you at Camp Lejeune for those two years? Yes, I was. Was that a good experience for you? Uh, I thought it was because, you know, Lejeune is a, a beautiful base, one of the nicest bases, in, I thought, in the Marine Corps at that time. And uh, these kids would come up from boot camp, and I enjoyed training them. We took them over cold weather exercises to Labrador. We go to Vieques, uh, where they want to stop all that shelling and bombing in Vieques, Puerto Rico, and practice landing there and machine gunning, and uh, trying to teach them how to everything about amphibious tractors. And it was a lot of fun time too. 
What rank and what type of decorations did you receive by the time you were discharged? No, none other than what I told you. That's what they give us when we get out. But you told me. Let's tell the audience listening to this. Okay. Do you remember? Okay, let me start off with the Korean Service Medal with two battle stars, Presidential Unit Citation with one battle star, Japanese occupation because I was there more than 30 days, the, UN, the uh, United Nations Ribbon, the Victory Medal, Combat Infantry Badge, South Korean Presidential Unit Citation, and the President of Korea cit Citation. That's remarkable. I think I named them all. And you were a sergeant at that point. When I got out, I got out as a buck sergeant. And uh, when I when I got out, I, I already passed the exam for staff sergeant. I could have been staff sergeant for six months. And the captain of my company, when I walked in, he called me and he says, "Get in here." I walked in and he said, "What's wrong with you? Don't you want to be staff sergeant?" I said, "Well, I know I passed the exam. I'd rather be a buck sergeant." Can I ask you why? Said, yeah, I'll tell you why. You know, in the morning when the lieutenant comes out of the branch, after we're all done uh, trooping, stomping, and you know, the exercise in the morning and all, they said, when you get in front of the barracks, the lieutenants walk right by the staff side of the detective, they come right to the buck side and say, what's going on today, Sarge? We, we're more powerful than the staff side. I don't want to be a staff side. He told me, get out of here. <laughs> so you stayed as a I just buck side all the way. Sergeant. But it's on my record that I made staff. Okay. What were your feelings about after four years in the Marines, coming home? You believe it or not, I came home with a little slight recession. And I didn't know what to do. Um, I said to my father, I'm going to try to work in Hartford, Connecticut. And I went to Hartford, I got a job at Underwood Typewriter Company, driving a forklift delivering letters and this to the Bible. I said, this is, can't be my life. I got to go back in the Marine Corps. One week I come home, I told my father, I'm going back in the Marine Corps. You're not going nowhere. You're going to stay home for crying out loud. I'm going to see you around here for a little while. Well, it was funny that next day I'm out, uh, on a, this, I came home on a Friday night. The next day I'm out and I went down to this little, little, little watering hole. I couldn't, I just turned 21. And I said, I'll try to get a glass of beer. So I went and had a glass of beer. My buddy said to me, hey, they're looking for guys in a warehouse. you would be kidding me, where? He said, Lauren's but a wholesale grocery. I ran right over there, they were still working. You guys need work? The boss said to me, the, the guy I interviewed really said, can you drive a forklift? I said, I sure can. He said, good, can you start Monday morning? I'll be here. I start at six o'clock on a Monday morning. I call into a typewriter. If I get anybody coming to me, you can either keep it or just mail it to me because I'm not going back. Yeah. I worked in there about four weeks, I guess, and I came back and I got this job. I stayed with them until January of 1960. And I got on the Bedford Fire Department. Got off the fire department and I went to work as chief of security at a hospital in New Bedford and I retired from there. When you came home, did you discuss with your family or friends, anything about what you had seen or done over no. in Korea? I couldn't talk about that war for 35 years. I just could not talk about it. What changed your mind? Uh, I can tell you that in a few words, too. Uh, when I joined, I looked at the newspaper one time, the Chosun Reservoir survivors were forming a group called the Chosun Few. Now, the reservoir actually name was Chad Jing, C-H-A-N-G, J-N, Chan Jing. Can you believe they call it the Chan Jing Few? So they nicknamed it the Chosen Few. Uh, I joined, and I guess I was involved with them for about five months, a few meetings and reunions and stuff like that. And this one day, uh, my buddy, his name was Don Gordon from New Hampshire, and he said, uh, would you be going to uh, Portsmouth for the uh, the guy, I forget his name, he got the Navy Cross, he got killed anyway in Korea. They're going to have another memorial for him, for his mother and father, going to present him with the medal. I said, well, I'd like to go up there. So I went up there, drove up. I was married at the time. Went up there with my wife and uh, went to the service. 
and it was such a touching service. We came back to the Marine Corps barracks, and you know, everybody 25 pounds heavier, and uh, some of the guys were balding already, and you start chewing the fat with these guys, and we're talking about battles and all the junk that goes along with it. Or no junk, I shouldn't say that, experiences that go along with it. And after that, I come home, and I said to my wife, you know, I learned a lot this weekend. I learned that I could get out of my shell by talking about this thing. It's a little bit of time. I took it slow. Who am I going to talk to in the Beth? There's only about four or five guys I knew. They were at the res none of them were at the reservoir. There was a few guys doing it in the Marine Corps. And I started talking to met some Army guys and met a few And I started talking, and, we got, and I got out of my shell. Now I go to schools and talk about it. I go to schools now for in my 17th year, I guess I go to schools and talk to the kids about the war in Korea. No, I don't like to talk about graphics. But I talk about the cultures and how the people were and the weather and you know, just talk about the military, how nice it was at boot camp, the funny stories. And, and I enjoy doing that with the kids. I show them the helmets and canteens and how we're trained to water, water uh, take a helmet full of water and wash your clothes with a helmet. And, of course, with the kids in school, you know, you say you're going to wash your underwear. Well, they all laugh. <laughs> big, big joke. And uh, I guess I cut out my shell by doing that. We're going up to Portsmouth there with my buddy that day. And I just mm -hmm. got out of the shell that day talking about it. Talking about it. And I think it helps, it helps them, too, to get it out. If you keep that stuff welled up inside you, it's really no good. A lot of guys are coming out of their shells now, you know. Well, what my brother talks to me about the Battle of the Bulge. He went for years, couldn't tell his kids. I couldn't tell my kids. My kids don't know what I did in, in the war. Now they know. They ask me questions, I'll answer them. Mm -hmm. I just don't like to, it's not like an interview with the family. You know, I, I just never like to tell the kids what you did. Because you know, right away they say, eh, yeah, I know. You walked uphill both ways to go to school and they give you all the baloney. So you just gotta stay away from it. But I, I, I not sorry that I started going to schools and talking to the kids because I think it took a lot out of me too. It's helped you, but it's oh. also helped them. Oh, it helped me a lot, a lot mm -hmm. awful lot. Yeah, I could clear mine now. Did you join any military reserve when you came home? I didn't have to. I had enough points. Okay. And what about joining any veterans organizations? Yes, they did. Tell us about those. I belonged to the VFW. I started, I joined the VFW in 1955. And uh, I couldn't get active because I started to coach Little League and girls softball and girls volleyball and, you know, foot, kids football. And I stayed with the coaching for a long time. And my boy, our youngest son, uh, when he got out playing football for high school and I ran the booster club there for a vocational high school in New Bedford. And uh, it was funny that... Uh, they used to pay me to do this, $6 a game. I said, oh, I'm a millionaire, you know. I don't want the money, come on. And I enjoyed it. And they put me announcing the games. And one day they said, you want to do some away games? Basketball games. I'm going to Seekonk, it's about 17 miles from New Bedford. And uh, I come out there that night, it was cold, rainy, my back is killing me. I said, what am I doing for six bucks a night? Hello, I don't need this. So I said, Went to the VFW and started get active. And I guess I hit the ground running, John, because I want to tell you something. They put me right in the chairs. I started as surgeon. I went from surgeon, which is a key thing that you just learn on the way up, bring guys band-aids when they get hurt. It's a big joke, the kind of a thing. And then I went to, from surgeon, I went to junior vice. Uh, sorry, I went to chaplain. I love the chaplain's job because you talk to sick people and stuff like that. Then I went to junior vice, senior vice, and commander my post. Two years of every rank except senior vice, only one. Then I went on into district, went all through those chairs to surgeon, chaplain, all the way up uh, to commander. At the time I was getting involved in a state. I became POW chairman in the state for 25 years. And I became a memorial setup guy for the memorials they do. In, uh, at our convention in June. And I really was getting involved in a whole lot of stuff, assistant membership chairs and buddy poppy drives and 
the community activity stuff, and I start really enjoying it. I said, hey, what am I doing here? Why don't I run for office? So I start running for office. I ran for surgeon and made it. Statewide. And statewide? Statewide. Then I made judge advocate. Then I went right into no chaplain because we had a band of cloth. Then I went to junior vice, senior vice. Then I became commander of the state, which I am right now. And I give up my title in two weeks. On June 8th, I'll be all done. How long have you been commander of the Massachusetts? They get one year office. Everybody get, when you get elected, you get one year office. That's all you get is one year. It was a very, very rewarding year. Mm -hmm. I advise anybody that can join the VFW to please do. Uh, they treat you like gold. I was very happily received everywhere I went. People were good. And the old saying is, you be good to the people on the way up, because you would see them on the way down. So I tried to be good to everybody. And I guess I want to say, I'm the first commander to start handing out awards. Everywhere I go, I bring them an award. And the people in the office were good to me, too. The quartermaster, Stan King, and the um, adjutant, Gordon Crosby, became a good friend of mine. And the, the secretary there, Sally Curley, what a wonderful woman. She's the one that does all these for me. The first one, she told you, I've never done this for all these commanders I've ever served under. But you know what? In community, I think you've got to get along with the community. We're supposed to be community oriented. And that's why I try to tell these kids this. Get into community, help the people. And that's what it's all about. So when you stepped down as commander, what will you do the next day? Probably cry. <laughs> no, I want to look myself in the mirror the next day and say, you did the best job you sure. possibly could. And I want, to, I want that guy in the mirror to look back at me and say, yeah, you did. But you'll still be involved and oh, go sure. to the meetings. And oh, yeah. Have you received any veterans benefits, hospitalization, GI Bill, or insurance? No GI Bill, but I do get this, the disability check for frostbite, mm -hmm. uh, and I get good treatment. I had open heart surgery, and I had it done at West Roxbury. All VA, uh, and uh, they treat you like gold. Mm -hmm. I cannot complain about the VA hospitalization service, especially in Massachusetts. You know, we have a lot of good hospitals in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. We got Brockton, to make a plane. We had Causeway Street for a while for hearing. Then we had uh, West Rock, but it's still there. We got Bedford Nursing Home. We got uh, Northampton, Chelsea Nursing Home. My word, they're all over the state. My friend is in Montana. His wife, uh, his father the VA system. He said his father has to pack a bag, prepare to sleep overnight, just to go to a clinic in Montana. He has to travel like 480 miles, go to a clinic. He says, he's not going to drive 480 miles back. He stays over and he comes back the next day. Can you imagine 500 miles in one day? No. I don't care if it's on one straight road. Mm. We're so very, very fortunate in Massachusetts. Uh, you can't believe. Mm -hmm. I advise everybody to get in the VA system. Have you attended, you mentioned earlier, reunions. Do you continue to attend reunions? Uh, these past two years I've been so busy with the VA. No, not the chosen few. But I will. I'll start going again. And when you have those meetings, where do you usually meet? Is it all over the country? or? No, uh, they go by New England chapter. Okay. We might go to New York. We might be in Connecticut. Might be right here in Boston area or Vermont. But we stay in the New England area because we call ourselves a New England chapter. Dues are cheap. Very cheap. 20 bucks a year. Hello. Mm -hmm. uh, How important to you was serving in the military? I thought it was very important. Number one, I learned an awful lot of discipline. Uh, I thought that if you're going to serve your country, you may as well do it the best you know how. Uh, as far as the Marine Corps is concerned, I just absolutely love it. And you know, you're never, never an ex-Marine. Once a Marine, always a Marine. You're always a former Marine. You're mm -hmm. never an ex-Marine. Mm -hmm. I know we have these birthday parties too, and nobody ever says ex-Marine. I could tell you a funny story about birthday parties. I don't know if this ever happened anywhere else. We had this guy, they called him up and said, hey, do you have the Marine Corps hymn to play at the Marine Corps birthday party? Only Marines are invited. No, no significant other than nothing. So we get in the hall that night. The, one of the banks in New Bedford decided to bring the food in. So we got sandwiches and partake in some adult beverages. And uh, you know, they called this one guy and we said, you got the Marine Corps hymn on a CD? He said, I sure do. Well, bring it with you, okay? So he brought a CD. And we had a colonel that was in the reserves. He says, 
wrinkle him. Everybody, head hot. He starts playing. They forgot the army song was the first one on CD. As Ace K songs were playing. <laughs> Whoa, time. <laughs> we started singing the Marine Corps hymn. He tried to put the buzz. Forget. <laughs> that had to be a little humorous. Oh, well, we had so much fun. Then. Every time we see him now, you got the same CD. I can't help but I'm here about it. Looking back on all of this, do you have any memorable either experiences or characters or humorous experiences that you'd like to share with us? Well, at boot camp, a lot of humor. A lot of humor at boot camp. Uh, the training was hard. But I can remember my DI. And what's the DI? A drill instructor. Okay. There was three of them. One of them had the same MOSI. He was served with me in Korea. And I said, why don't you start pulling the hairs off your chest now, buddy? And he, you know, he, that was his job. He was training. He was a good, good drill instructor. But one of the good ones was this, uh, when you get in the boot camp and you're in about a week, you got to put a little water in your shoe can and your shoe polish cover, and that's how you spit shine your shoes. Build it, build it up with wax. You just keep circling around and build it with wax. Well, he appoints, the drill instructor appoints, an undertaker, and six pallbearers. And then one night we're learning on a 30 caliber machine gun in the classroom at, in, in boot camp now. Can't talk, but you get your legs crossed and you get the water that cover of the shoe polish. Everybody's shoe polish their shoes. And he asked a question, and this one guy gets up and he says, some dumb question he asked the DI. The DI says, you know what you're talking about, drop dead. The guy said, yesterday went to get the I said, drop dead. So the guy goes, bloop, you fell on the other guys. He says, I want my six pauvres and my other thing. So five guys get up, the other thing, and five pauvres. Where's my other pauvres? He gets up and says, it's me, sir. <laughs> <laughs> You're dead. <laughs> you know what they did with him? They put him in a soap locker. In a G, they call it a GI locker. And the DI forgot him. Next morning, a roll call, he said, where is that idiot? So the, the platoon sergeant said to him, you left him, you, you left him in, in the GI locker, sir. Oh, wow, go get him. <laughs> Fall asleep on a shelf. Oh, my word. How large was this locker? It was like a big closet, probably around 10 or 12 feet long, about four or five feet wide. Oh, kind of soap and everything you used to do the floors. And we did our own floors, our own clothes. And everything. Oh, that was... <laughs> But it was a lot of good stories. I, I enjoyed I enjoyed my boot camp. You can't expect to go in there to cakewalk. You sure. need to learn, you learn to be trained and yeah. pay attention. But you also had some humor that you could remember too. Oh yes, a lot of humor, yeah. Above all, is there a thought, an incident, or any additional comments that you would like to share, not only with us, but with your family who will be getting a copy of this interview? Well, I can tell you right now, my family is very supportive of me. My immediate family, when I joined the Marine Corps, were all supportive of me. Back then, they were all living. All my brothers and sisters were alive when I went in the Marine Corps. Since then, I've lost two brothers and two sisters. But I can always say they were always very supportive of me. They always wrote to me. And whenever I could, could get a chance, I'd write back to them. And when I come home, they always had come on over for supper, come on over. Well, I had four sisters and three brothers. You know, you feel for five days, but you get all these suppers together. But I had one of my sisters, when I come home from Korea, she had the Christmas tree on. And I said, boy, that was so beautiful of her to do that, put the Christmas tree on when I come home. And she, would, she wouldn't take it off, she said, until after Christmas. So I said, that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Stuff you can remember. And stuff that you dream of that you want to eat when you get home, all I do is call my sister and she say, sure, come on over. You know, all that stuff, I, I was very, they were very supportive of me. And I always, always appreciated that. Is there any other comments you'd like to make before we complete this interview? Well, except that I'd like to thank you for what you've done. And I can prove that because I, when you come and speak at the council meeting, I was overwhelmed by your presentation. So I thought it was very nice. And our cameraman over here, a nice guy, he's been listening to me and watching me all this time. I didn't get a chance to watch him. And I uh, certainly agree with being interviewed about anything. 
But one thing I like to say, every commander has a project. My commander this past year was neuroblastoma in children. And neuroblastoma is a cancer that invades a child's brain. Whatever part of the body that that brain functions is the part that the child gets the cancer in. And they very, very rarely live beyond the age of 10. Now, some people go all through their life, they've never heard of the word neuroblastoma. But neuroblastoma is a very fatal cancer. I went to the research department in, in the Children's Hospital in Boston. All the money that we collected to see over 20000 for neuroblastoma all goes to research. And the research, after going to that research department, I, I would like to have people just keep sending money there in, in honor of neuroblastoma. And the reason why is they think they've come onto something with omega-3 fish oil. They really believe they've hit on something. And it seems, it seems like they were injecting these, ch uh, giving these children omega-3 fish oil, and it seems to hold this cancer in abeyance right now at this point in time. The studies and research are still going on and on, but they're trying, they're doing the best they can to get there. Very, very brilliant, brilliant doctors in that Boston area. Oh, unbelievable. And some of the funding that you've helped has We'll go to all that research, and I am so very proud to have part of that. And uh, the one who put me on to that was a Dr. Dodd, Michael Dodd. And I was introduced to him by a, a woman who was a past president of the auxiliary. Her name was Jerry Rumsis. And uh, she introduced me to Dr. Dodd. He got a child with it. So you he's know, a personal interest along with a medical interest. Exactly. This personal interest, and when he talks, he gets teary-eyed. I can understand why. If I had a child with that, too, I'd get teary-eyed also. Mm -hmm. And he, they, I, I just uh, love kids, and I don't want to see any kid get hurt. And I thought it was my way of saying thank you to all the children. And I got to thank everybody in the VFW for what they've done for me, because I was, would have been happy with about 10,000. These guys come up, they step up to the bat. And they, uh, they just step up to the plate and say, hey, let's go. How much have you raised over the year? Over $20,000. That's wonderful. I'm so proud. Mm -hmm. I, I was so very proud of my past year's accomplishment with the VFW. I can't believe how happy I am. I'm going to be very sad to see it go in two weeks, but you know what? All good things are going to come to an end. And you'll keep busy with the VFW as it is. Yes, I, indeed I will. Roland Jenner, and we want to thank you for coming in today and sharing your story Thank you with very us. much for having me, Joan. I appreciate everything you've done. Thank God you. God bless you. Thank you.